we're, we're really fond of talking about ourselves as an innovation event, and, and we like stuff that moves the needle, regardless of whether you plug it in or not. Uh, welcome back to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Uh, very happy to be joined by uh, Greg Greg Rosenbaum and Ronald Reed from uh, South by Southwest EDU. Welcome, gentlemen. Oh, happy to be here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, we had the opportunity uh, to do a live taping of our podcast uh, at the Expo stage yesterday, and we just had a blast. So uh, we've been having an amazing time here at South by Southwest EDU. Um, I kind of wanted to go through uh, some of the origin story of uh, South by Southwest EDU. Uh, storytelling is a theme. Uh, we're seeing really throughout the conference. So I wonder if uh, between the two of you, uh, you could maybe let us know how this whole thing uh, got started. Sure. Um, well, first of all, uh, again, real, really happy to be visiting with you. And, and Greg and I both started with South by Southwest to launch the EDU conference. And so we probably each have some contribution to the origin story. Uh, for my part, longtime Austinite, went to high school here at the University of Texas, grew up here, have attended South By. In fact, the, my best friend in high school is the guy who founded South By Southwest, the uh, music uh, uh, portion, the original piece of it. And he continues to as the CEO today of the, uh, of the organization. So as Roland was growing South by Southwest music and, and grew into multimedia, which expanded into the film and the tech conference, he and I had been talking for like 20 or 25 years, is there anything we could do with this brand in the education sector? And it was kind of appealing, but I, I just didn't really see, see it very clearly. And then 2008, uh, 2009, a big recession, uh, public ed funding shrank a bunch. And so I started talking to Roland about, you know, if folks don't have the resources to do what they've always been doing, then they might need to do things differently. And so maybe there's a little bit of an opportunity to have a conversation about South by and EDU education mm -hmm. again. Yeah. So we, uh, we started dreaming and scheming on it, uh, had the good fortune of posting up a couple of education systems at the South by Maine conference yeah. and got a tremendous response and were smart enough to go out and hire Greg to help us <laughs> uh, build South by Southwest uh, EDU. So our first event in 2011 uh, was really a, a Texas regional event. Yeah. We partnered with an education agency for the state who had a big initiative they wanted to celebrate and we thought it provided a nice vehicle to launch a conference and then uh, quickly kind of ran and grew it in other areas as opposed to being a regional state conference on it. Um, but then Greg is now functioning as general manager and is really overseeing the growth and the development of the program in those in those years since uh, right. and, and year one as well. And how about that that aspect of the, the story too? So like I know Austin uh, itself, especially you know uh, if you're going all the way back to the the seventies. <laughs> I'm, I'm super old, yeah. I'm, <laughs> but uh, but I'm sure you could tell some stories about how how Austin has changed over the years and how South South by Southwest has really changed Austin. But uh, but having you know begun with a regional conference, you know an EDU EDU spinoff of of South by Southwest. What's it been like in this, uh, I guess, nine-year run, right? This is your ninth year of doing the conference. Um, uh, maybe, uh, you know, Greg, I don't know if you uh, have some, uh, some color to add. Yeah, sure. Um, so initially, it was sort of finding the community, right? And, and South by Southwest, known for music, film, interactive technology, maybe less so for education. So finding your community locally was sort of a great place to start. But we always had aspirations of translating South by Southwest for the education community in a truly South by Southwest manner. And so the last nine years has been sort of built to, to uh, encapsulate what South by Southwest is, which is a conference and festival. So you'll notice at the event now we have a film, a series of film screenings we do, we've done for the last seven years. We do a series of competitions dedicated to early stage startups, physical design and learning. We have an expo. We have all these pieces that we call our festival elements in addition to a really large scale conference. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing that's been really interesting to grow over the last nine years has been the audience. And South by Southwest is known as a convergence zone for, for technology and music and film. And so we've done that with an education by spanning the full learning life cycle, everything from early learning through K-12, higher education, mm -hmm. and adult learning workforce development issues. And then really looking to bring together 
all the disparate stakeholders, which when we started this conference nine years ago was somewhat unique in the landscape of education conferences, which typically focus on the middle school science teacher conference or the, the high school principals conference, which are all wonderful uh, experiences. And we're just trying to create a complementary experience for that community. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about uh, diversity and inclusion, which is a big part of uh, you know, the themes. Uh, we did that Ed Surge article uh, we were talking about where they pulled all the metadata from South by Southwest. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very cool stuff. Um, but, uh, but it does seem like even from an educational perspective, you're kind of sampling from a wide array of inputs. Like you're actually trying to almost create surprising collisions where like somebody who who's here for workforce development uh, winds up connecting with like a, a, a K through five educator, you know, and like mm -hmm. those kinds of connections seem to be a really uh, interesting part of, uh, of what you've kind of built here. Um, who like maybe just to give us a little more color on that, like who's a typical or is there no typical? I mean, I don't know who typically comes to uh, South by Southwest EDU and then who, you know, in a perfect world, uh, would you like to see more of? Well, Greg, Greg's got the stats down, so I'll defer to, to <laughs> him uh, on that. But but I, I think at a higher level, uh, again, maybe to reiterate uh, something Greg shared, I, I think our vision and I spent a lot of time in the K-12 marketplace and it. It, it, it always seemed very siloed to me, to Greg's point, very role-specific convenings, and the chasm between K-12 and higher ed was just humongous, uh, just different communities. And so that always felt unnecessary and unwise at a high level. And so again, kind of adapting that convergent zone mentality of put all the stakeholders in the room together and, and see what happens mm -hmm. uh, felt really appropriate for the brand. And, and it seems like it's, it's really resonated well with the community at large. And so, again, great growth. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Greg kind of hit the, hit the highlights for you. But the diversity of community is something that we think a lot about mm -hmm. and feel is a real distinctive element of yeah, what we try to do. You definitely, as, as a participant, you do feel it. I love that. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So we've gone from sort of 800 to 8,000 in, in our first eight years in terms of registration growth and participation at the event annually. And one of the things that's been interesting is by year two or year three, we had sort of established the different communities that were coming in large groups. So classroom practitioners, be them early learning, K-12 higher education practitioners, administrators, business leaders, uh, foundations and nonprofits, policymakers. We started seeing those crop up in very similar percentages uh, makeups of the community. So we'd see more like 40, 45% from the administrator and classroom practitioner bucket. We'd see another 30% from business and industry and uh, another 25% from government, nonprofit, foundation, and student participation. And so um, we've actually seen that kind of maintain as the audience has grown. And so we see maybe a similar level of growth as we move forward. But, but the, the point is that we try to create an open tent here and really create a space for anyone to come engage. There are a lot of education stakeholders out there. There's no need to limit sort of the, the bounds of that. And we're actually doing something this year for the first time, which is building a summit on the, the last day of South by Southwest EDU, which is the day before South by Southwest kicks off, where we're actually bridging the gap between the education community and the sort of talent pipeline workforce development community that's at the technology convening is those executives think about what they need from a talent perspective, and we think about how are we developing that talent. The educational side of that conversation is really interesting from an EDU perspective, mm -hmm. and so we're creating a series of programs around that on Thursday that are open not only to EDU registrants, but also South by Southwest registrants to kind of have another layer of convergence in the context of EDU. Yeah, I love the idea of uh, the convergence zone and, you know, those sort of happy accidents, you know, like you, you, you run into somebody, you begin to spark up a conversation. Uh, we were talking about uh, talking to folks from uh, the, the Aspen Institute yeah. earlier today and the phenomenal keynote uh, the other day, but, uh, but just started a sort of casual conversation that wound up lasting 40 five minutes and uh you know it's just it's the dynamics are, are you know you it, there's like a feeling there's like a cultural uh sort of experience of being here uh it also seems very much um uh you know even your percentages kind of talk to this it does seem very much uh really about the teachers you know so like it's about everything uh obviously and it's inclusive but like you definitely get a feel that there are the actual like the makers, the doers, uh, the front lines of delivering, you know, educational experiences uh, really across across our country, across the world. Um, 
what kind of trends, you know, we're a trend spotting education show. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's right in the name. Uh, we, get, we, get titch, we get titular sometimes. <laughs> but um, any, uh, any general thoughts about uh, trends you're seeing around, around teachers and around uh, sort of their needs and, and what's kind of emerging there? Yeah, maybe so, and, and, and maybe we'll tag team it again sure, and uh, sure. give a little higher, higher level. And, and, and Greg's done a lot of look see, uh, uh, and the whole team at, at sort of the uh, the programming attributes that come that the community brings us, uh, and so forth. But I think at a high level, as we talk about sort of the growth of the community, I think one one of the things that we're observing observing is just. When we launched eight years ago, it was really kind of a conversation mostly about the structures and systems of school, and the conversations were a lot about the school day. And so, you know, eight, nine years ago, it was Common Core, it was high stakes assessment, um, and, and a lot of energy. And, you know, some of that certainly remains, uh, but we see a growth in those topics now that we, we kind of think of as more uh, the intersection of culture and learning. And, and some of those we see on the program are like mindfulness and school safety and, you know, uh, um, sort of reality-based curriculum and strategies and so forth. So we're, we're liking the evolution of the conversation about education to become more a discussion about learning. And when we think about learning, um, in that context, uh, then I, I, we get really excited about yeah. the opportunities uh, for it. That's yeah, that's really interesting too. Something we've seen is like the the power of the word learning. Uh, as edu- education brings a little more of like an institutional yeah. mm-hmm. kind of context, where like learning and the learner is uh, is much more of a, a personal, individual uh, kind of experience, and then uh, combining learning with sort of the community aspects of what you're sort of driving at is something that, that, that we're certainly interested in. Uh, how about uh, from your side, Greg, anything you're noticing around uh, sort of teachers? And then I think we'll probably spend a little time talking about ed tech uh, sure. next. Yeah, well, it's a sort of a great transition because I think initially when we first started South by Southwest CDE, the first year was in partnership locally. I think as we grew from there to a national audience, I think it was a quick uh, opportunity for folks that, from a technology background that were interested in South by Southwest to have this new forum. And so we kind of had this new entrepreneur at tech community very strong in 2012 and 2013. And now that we're entering our ninth year and coming to the close of a decade, we've sort of seen the conversation around ed tech change a lot. It was uh, about the the new hardware, the tablet, then it turned into personalized learning, a delivery mechanism. And now what we're seeing, and I think part of the reason why educators are so prominent here, is it's about human-centered connection. And we're talking about social-emotional learning, Mm -hmm. all these things that are about human-to-human contact, which is part of the value of being at a convening like South by Southwest EDU. So I think technology is, is now moving in a place where it's playing a more passive role, and it's about enabling the teacher's role in the classroom to be as, you know, uh, prominent and effective with that one-on-one connection with students as possible. Mm-hmm. So the blended learning, project-based learning practices that allow teachers to move around in the classroom and kind of connect with different folks. Um, technologies that amplify that, I think, have sort of risen to the top. And, and that's why artificial intelligence and, and some of these other big topics um, have a promise to further build uh, technology around the connection between teacher and, and pupil. Mm-hmm. Which is still, at the end of the day, a, a very human Mm-hmm. dynamic like we talk a lot about the difference between uh technology driven and te- technology enabled uh innovation and like if you're hey there's robots let's put robots in classrooms right. okay we're done you know like that you guys probably saw that happening and and ron i know you've you've, you've yeah. spent years in over in, a long career yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. many uh so many um you know pendulum swings and, yeah. and so forth and in fact we're, we're really fond of talking about ourselves as an innovation event and, and we like stuff that moves the needle regardless of whether you plug it in or not and so that's why we're kind of excited to see the conversation about mindfulness and mm-hmm. sel become so prominent it it, it has i think a complement to sort of the energy of technology in our lives to to sort of refocus. I think the the other thing I'll share relative to to, to Greg's observations about the, the human connection is we were kind of intentional in the early days of South by EDU to not lean too heavy into arts ed because we had a big music film and tech community. Right. And we, we, we wanted to build our own community of, uh, of educators in, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in that respect. And so one of the things that we've enjoyed over the, uh, over the last few years is being able to grow more of that programming. So this year, 
number of performances on yeah. the program that sort of speak to. In fact, we were just chatting with some folks that uh, went through a playwriting challenge. Mm -hmm. and, and when you t think of storytelling and engaging learners on it, uh, it there's a richness to the program, uh, embracing uh, arts that uh, we're excited to get to it, kind of always wanted to, but thought there was some prudence to sort of growing our community in advance. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. And, uh, you know, the, many of these themes appear in our March Madness bracket uh, <laughs> as, as well, which, which is also a, a cool, uh, cool connection there. Um, so, uh, so I think you guys touched a little bit uh, on this, but, uh, but just if we did want to geek out at all, are there any uh, technology uh, things that are emerging uh, that are sort of capturing your imagination that you think are going to uh, really transform, even if it is human powered, like, you know, human powered augmented with like these new technologies that are emerging are there any of them that are um definitely piquing your curiosity no i'll, I'll I, I don't know that this is going to be a great response to it but I, i'm thinking about sort of a trending topic at this year's event and just kind of reflecting on its different portrayals across the context of the event so when again from a, a culture and learning uh, standpoint a, a little bit school safety begins to come to play so all of a sudden we have a lot of conversation and content about that, which we're super excited to present and feel like it's terribly germane to the community that we serve. Um, and so, um, you know, some rather uh, poignant elements of sort of student voice as a driver uh, on the school safety coming out of the Parkland experience as we were talking. So, you know, I, I'm excited. I, I think it is tomorrow that Dan Rather's in conversation with David Hogg, the uh -huh. young student who launched uh, yes. March for Our Lives. Uh -huh. And, and so uh, as one example of sort of student voice and agency, I, I think we had a, a session yesterday in our policy forum uh, that was looking at the physical design of schools from a space and architecture. In fact, the American Institute of Architects were participants and it's like, how lovely for that voice at an education event to lend perspective uh, to that. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, appreciating the, uh, the probe was more specific to tech inventions in, in some respects. And uh, again, to Greg's point, we're seeing a lot of fun things with AR and VR. And, and I think a lot of early explorations into where does this really fit and how does it really move. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, uh, again, the, the, the human connection and, and context of those topics gets really rich, rich, rich. Yeah, the the uh, I hadn't even. I'm sorry, I missed that session. That's 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 like <laughs> tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow, even better. But, uh, but just the idea of like thinking about the the architecture, like the physical spaces in which uh, education is happening. That's just a that's a really rich area, and I actually I'm really happy for that response because I was just in some ways falling prey to that that you know being a little too tech <laughs> in, in the mindset. Uh, but uh, any any thoughts uh, on your side, Greg? Yeah, well, I'll lean into the tech, given right. the actions you. formerly. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, you know, I think we've talked a lot about uh, VR and, and AR as being prominent topics, and there's now this move to experience reality and, and how that's shifting. I think time will tell sort of how that is adopted more broadly. So I think we're seeing really cool applications of it sort of in, in bits and pieces, but not wide scale application. Uh, but another number of big organizations are here like Unity and others yeah. that are sort of demonstrating the power and the prowess of it. Um, and, and what's really interesting about a lot of the conversations we have about technology at, this, at the event here is that it's not only about the use of it in, in an educational platform, but how do you train students to be empowered to use that technology when they get to the point where they're developing games or they're developing mm -hmm. experience reality or how are they doing blockchain or, or AI right. or other things that are um, going to be part of their professional world when they get out of school. Right, right. Very much. Uh, it's interesting. We, you know, we do a trending in education podcast and uh, winds up very often becoming a conversation about the future of work, you know, mm -hmm. and like, uh, that space is just enormously interesting on a number of fronts because I, I think we don't really know what we don't know either. Like we're not like like what's exactly going to happen, you know? Because like on the one hand, there's all the positive elements of technology, but then on the other hand, there's the all the privacy and um, you know like just data security concerns that are raised. Um, uh, what are we going to talk about next? Uh, so, uh, 
Yeah, so uh, I was really struck. Uh, I think we all, uh, our whole contingent were, was were struck uh, by uh, was struck. I'll get there <laughs> uh, by uh, by the the feeling of community that you just experience by being here. And I'm um, uh, I'm really curious. Well, first off, great job by you guys to build that. But I'm but I'm curious about like how what happens with that energy after the conference ends. Like, how do we sort of extend that uh, beyond this. This is almost like a, a moment in time where you're sort of you know, getting the, 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 the additive value of everybody coming to this convergence point. Where does it go from there? Like, how do you guys think about the rest of the year? Because uh, I know planning this obviously is no small undertaking, but it does feel like you know, it's almost like we're all activated from these like, inspirational keynotes and you know, we're really ready to you know, go forth and change the world. How do you guys think about the rest of the year? It's a great question. I think one that not just us, but, but many conference organizers think about how do you extend the, just the experience of something that lasts four days, but you spend the other 361 days of the year planning and working towards. Um, we've tried a bunch of different things over the years, and it kind of started from something that South by Southwest did in their 25th year, which was they did 25 parties in 25 different cities in like the six weeks before South by Southwest kicked off. And they were activating micro communities from their larger community, connecting people prior to the event and also convening people in smaller groups. And so something that's been core to our work for the last seven or eight years has been going to different communities and cultivating and activating sort of meetups in those communities. And they're typically in conjunction with, um, since we're sort of on a cyclical calendar, the call for proposals, which we do as a community-fueled fueled process. We open a panel picker, which will accept over 1,500 proposals and narrow that down into the four or 500 sessions you see at the event. Um, and that's done through community voting and through an advisory board review and staff review as well. Um, and, and, and bringing people together around that gives them sort of a shared purpose and an opportunity to say, okay, we connected in March, we're seeing each other again in our own city, and we're saying there's something that we're both doing that'd be really interesting to bring to the stage at South By. And years and years of doing this, I think, has really, has really helped. And the other aspect of that is we've tried to virtualize that a little bit, and I think we have ways to go in building technology to support that, but we have a social network that connects attendees here through EDU Social, and so that community exists digitally for nine months of the year before we flip and start the next year's cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a few things, but I think it's definitely something we spend a lot of time thinking about. Yeah, yeah, and any any thoughts, Ron? Or? Yeah, um, maybe, maybe a few. I, I think we, we consider ourselves really privileged, like we, we've, we think of ourselves more as community organizers and event planners. Like we think about how do we bring the disparate folks here? How do we help make them feel welcomed and engaged and empowered? Um, and and so in, in that respect, um, yeah, I'm really really proud of, of the community experience that that, uh, that that comes together at EDU. And to Greg's point, you know, our sort of pursuit and chase of that throughout the year is something that uh, that we really enjoy. We're also observing that, uh, again, there's, there's sort of a fun uh, observation, and, and I, I'm hopeful I haven't started this conversation earlier in the same uh, <laughs> podcast, but this notion of, of sort of the tensions between systemic change and, and local uh, engagements. And so, again, we can talk about big picture issues and opportunities, but we know at a community level it looks and behaves very different to that community. It's a lot of what David Brooks was talking yeah. about with, uh, with Weave. And, and so I think we're really intrigued with how to support local conversations that culminate at EDU and see that as just part of the grander continuum in some ways of trying to drive impact and, 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 and community. Yeah, it make, makes a lot of sense. The old, old saw, think globally, act locally, uh, you kind of, you feel that nowadays, like I, I'm because when you try to go too broad, the whole you know boil the ocean uh, <laughs> sort of uh, trope. But uh, but uh, yeah, um, and I and I know there's a big year on the horizon, right? So like 2020 is uh, is next year. I'm doing if I'm checking my math. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, any thoughts uh, on uh, the year ahead? You know, like we're we're trying to you know, again, to throw more cliches at you, we try to skate to where the puck is going. Uh, next year, there might be some interesting uh, shots on goal. So uh, any, any thoughts about uh, what's coming next? 
Well, 2020 also marks the 10 year anniversary of South by Southwest EDU and a decade of not developing community, doing panel picker, reflecting a decade's worth of data from that community sort of sourcing of, of trends and topics. So I think what will be interesting for us is not only to look forward, but also to do a retrospective look and see where have we come, what, what was the, 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 get, the, get, the chasm that we crossed over the course of the last decade, and what does that mean for 2020 to 2030 and start projecting what that next decade means. Um, and, and, you know, Ron talked about it earlier, the, the change from sort of high stakes testing into uh, a much more testing neutral sort of environment. And that all shifted from a policy standpoint. So I think there's an uh, Every Student Succeeds Act also passed in this decade. And we're seeing some big policy changes that I think have long term implications that will be fully realized when we get to 2020 and beyond. One that we haven't talked about has been the role of libraries in schools and in mm. communities as community spaces, mm. um, which has been a smaller topic here, but, but one we see trending moving forward. And, and ESSA passing led to a like, reinvigorated role for the librarian and the library within the school as a community convening space and a place for work and connection and not just uh, reading and researching and writing, but but all sorts of learning that could happen within that physical space. I, I love the, on a personal level. My wife uh, is a li well information scientist, yes, uh, yeah. librarian. <laughs> so uh, so you scored scored there. Nice job. But uh, but yeah. Um, and uh, you know, as we're as we're, I could go on at length. And thanks again uh, for for giving us uh, giving us some time. But. Um, you know, interesting. Just real quick on the library front too. It's another. It reminds me of what you were talking about, Ron, too. Just around, just the physical design yeah. of those spaces. Like, how do you design spaces that foster community rather than isolation? Uh, is a really interesting. Uh, you, you got my wheels turning. So, uh, yeah. and, and forgive me, I have to to jump on it as well because uh, the new Austin Public Library is really a sight to behold. I think time rated as one of the hundred great buildings on the planet or something. Oh, wow. And, and it is certainly very cool, but their library director, uh, Roosevelt Weeks, has become a good friend, uh, was in fact the MC or one of the MCs for our design competition on the program this year. So we would concur. We think, you know, libraries are really, really fascinating spaces and are just learning uh, really interesting stories about the evolution of those spaces at a community level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, as we're wrapping up, uh, maybe uh, some parting uh Parting thoughts, words of wisdom. Uh, <laughs> um, parting, parting thoughts, maybe. Uh, the yeah. words of wisdom, but we'll set aside uh, for a, a moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think maybe the, the two things I'll share, uh, having sort of kind of observed the space for a long time, is I'm really intrigued with this connection of mindfulness and technology. I, I don't think they're as dissimilar as I sometimes want to, to portray them. Um, and, and so I, I do think a little bit about, uh, I think to a, a point that Greg made, technology's opportunity to empower the human connection rather than undermining it. Can we free more time for our educators to connect on that personal level as opposed to the earlier conversation of replacing those teachers, which I just don't see. Mm -hmm. um, so in that respect, I, I also think that while the mindfulness conversation is often directed to learners at this point. I think self-care for teachers is an increasingly an important topic that I, I think we'll see more on the program on and is a, a, a natural outgrowth of this attentiveness to uh, emotional and social health and, mm -hmm. and such with it. Awesome. Yeah, for my part, I'd say, you know, a thought that came to mind earlier as we were talking about how do you extend the impact of South by Southwest EU beyond the four days is that there are things that we're doing to try and help cultivate that, but this community has sort of an energy and spirit of its own. Yeah. And that I think one of the things that I hope people take away from the event is just in, empowerment. And I think our keynote this morning, Patrick Alua, who talked about founding a university in Ghana after spending some time at Microsoft and feeling a pull to go do something and starting with 30 students and growing it from there should feel very empowering that we all have an ability to kind of make that change we see. And so I hope from the, the stimulation that comes from this conference that it's just sort of emanating, not necessarily through things that we're directly connected with, but through things that are just happening more broadly. That's fantastic. Uh, like I said, uh, I would love, if you guys want to come on a podcast anytime around the year when you're not in the thick of uh, the conference <laughs> planning, we're, we're here for you. But, uh, but yeah, so uh, Greg Rosenblum, uh, Rosenbaum, sorry, and, uh, and uh, Ron Reed, thanks very much for, for joining us on the show. Thank you.